So a woman is thrown face first down in the dirt right there at the rabbi's feet. And it was just a moment ago that she was so carefree and alive, smiling, hurrying from her house to his the way that she always did in the early afternoon when the kids were off at school and her husband was at work and she could be with him. Now on her wedding day, she never would have imagined that she would become an adulteress, but but here with him, that's the only place that she felt alive again, the way that she used to. But then the priest walked in on them, shamed her publicly as a prop to try to discredit Jesus, tore her out of the bed, and then marched her with a fistful of her hair in his hand right down Main Street, and then threw her down at the feet of the rabbi. Moses says to stone her. You going to disagree with the law? It was the perfect trap. I mean, wedging Jesus right between the people and the law. So she's lying there, wrapped in nothing but a sheet, with her cheek pressed against the dirt. The carefree thrill of a few minutes ago has been replaced by a heavy blanket of shame as the questions race through her mind. How long have they known? And who else knows? And who's going to pick the kids up? And will they bring them here? Will they show me to them like this as some kind of warning? And what does it feel like when they actually stone you? Jesus doesn't say anything to the priest's question. Not right away, at least. He just lets the silence hang, and he stoops down right next to her head and starts drawing in the dirt probably close enough that she can hear the trace of his finger there in the sand. And then when the silence is hung heavy enough for long enough that the priest is about to say something else just to try to break the moment, Jesus stands up and he says something along the lines of, all right, stoner. But whichever one of you is without sin, make sure you're the one that throws the first rock. Plop, plop, plop. She had to have flinched when the first one hit the ground. But it only would have taken her a minute to realize they're not throwing stones. They're dropping them. And with every accuser finally gone, she looks up into the eyes of love and love only, and she hears his voice say, then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. And this is the story that she would have gone on telling forever. The moment that she wanted to hide away becomes the moment that she retells again and again. The the place of greatest fear and shame in her life becomes the greatest place of intimacy and grace because that's the kind of author God is. He doesn't edit. He repurposes and redeems. But of course, what would have been impossible for her to know, still stunned by this sudden intrusion of love, is that the real fight of her life has just begun. The real fight is every moment after the transcendent, memorable day. And Jesus still surprises people with the sort of mercy that tends to sound cliche until it comes and finds me. And then love picks the lock of my heart in a way that enters into my story in such a personal and inhabited way that it just unravels me from the inside out. You know, we've all got a woman caught in adultery moment or two in our past that has profoundly reshaped us. But it's the many moments after the passionate encounter, it's the fidelity that we find underwhelming and disenchanting. The exhilaration of our mountaintop experience wears off and then we find ourselves reluctantly dragging our feet behind Jesus down the narrow path, mildly bored and mostly disinterested. The real fight of faith is all the ordinary days after the breakthrough, after the climactic moment, because of something that we all know but are too light to just come right out and admit, or too polite to come right out and admit most of the time. And it's this that fidelity is boring. I mean, fidelity is rich and satisfying, and it meets the deep needs of the human soul in a way that our surface urges can never touch, but it's also boring most of the time. And that leaves us with a few bad options for riding out the remainder of our Christian life. We can either go through the motions, passionless and half-pretending, or we can obsess over recapturing the climactic moment, even if we've got to knowingly manipulate ourselves on some level, even if we have to manufacture it somehow. 
Or we can just wander away disappointed, admitting that intimacy with God left me somewhere short of satisfied, so I guess I'll go looking somewhere else. There are highs and lows in our spiritual lives. There is supernatural encounter and there is existential crisis, but the most common condition found in the pews of your local house of worship on any given Sunday morning is a general malaise of spiritual boredom. Ronald Rollheiser says the single greatest obstacle to sustaining a life of prayer is simple boredom and the sense that nothing meaningful is happening. But that does not mean we are regressing in prayer. It often means the opposite. So what if boredom is a good sign, not a bad one, if we engage it as an invitation? And what if boring fidelity is the hidden in plain sight invitation to discover the life in prayer that Jesus so lavishly promised? You see, the Bible is not so much a rule book or a set of directions as it is a love story, a romantic and courageous love story that we're invited to believe and inhabit. And we can see that whole story captured in just a single moment when a woman is caught in shame and then thrown at the rabbi's feet. But we can see the story just as clearly if we zoom all the way out to see the meta story that God has been writing since hanging the stars in the night sky. Fidelity is the oldest, truest story. All the way back at the beginning on the Bible's opening page, after separating light from dark and land from sea, God parades all of the animals in front of Adam, tasking him with naming every last one of them. Now, why is naming the animals wedged right into the middle of creation, right between man and woman? I mean, why is God slowing the show down for this menial task? Because God's letting Adam feel his own deep longing, the longing for a partner, for a counterpart, for a bride in the language of the New Testament. And then after God has let Adam feel that longing for companionship that cannot be met anywhere in present creation, he creates woman out of man, bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh, a counterpart, a bride, and poetry pours forth from his lips. But of course, fidelity is boring. So it doesn't take long for that climactic moment of poetry to become the long slog of ordinary days. And Adam and Eve both choose a lesser love, ripping a seam right through the in middle of the story. Intimacy is broken, broken intimacy with God, broken intimacy between people. God's recreation plan is then an, essentially just a re-up on the original creation intent. He, he starts the redemption of the whole human race with just one couple in love, Abram and Sarai. And God makes a covenant with them. I love you. And I will love you no matter what. I am not striking a deal here with terms and conditions. I'm making a promise. All I ask is that you accept it, that you take my love. But again, fidelity is boring. And so even a covenant love that generous has wandered from in the slog of ordinary days that followed, leading to descriptions peppered throughout the Old Testament of Israel as an unfaithful wife who's gone after other lovers. To fully redeem the intimacy that was lost in infidelity, God then places his divine being in the womb of a fallen woman. God becomes bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This is the author flipping back to page one to redeem every bit of the story that's gone far off plot. Uh, in the Last Supper, then, Jesus used the imagery uh, of, of a wine glass being slid across the table to his disciples to seal his covenant. This was identical to the way that a proposal was done in the first century Hebrew world. You see, in first century Israel, no one dropped to a knee with a ring the way that we commonly do today. Instead, a potential bridegroom would gather with friends and family in the house of the potential bride, slide a glass of wine across the table, and if she drinks it, she says yes. If she doesn't drink it, she says no. That's how it went down. On the last night of his life, Jesus slides a wine glass across the table to his followers and says, drink. It's a proposal. At the end of the meal, he said, I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now, on, from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus is looking forward to a coming day when he'll enjoy this wine again with you and me. It's a wink or a tell to what's coming on the last page of the story. Revelation 19, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. The biblical picture of the end is not a catastrophic apocalypse. It's a wedding reception. 
It's a bridegroom who's come to live forever with, her, with his bride. And so here is the whole mission of Jesus. The wound opened up by infidelity has been mended by fidelity, by a love that will never give up. And here is the commission that he gives to us. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. Remain. Fidelity. But how do we remain in that love? I mean, how do we make a love this complete, more than just an occasional comforting reflection, uh, but, but the emotional floor that we feel from, and the setting before which the scenes of our lives play out, and the true story along which our thought patterns run in cooperation with? How do we keep on choosing Jesus on all of the ordinary days after the breakthrough? Prayer. Prayer is about love. St. Augustine, widely considered the most influential theologian in the history of the church, says true, whole prayer is nothing but love. More recently, Johannes Hartel, who operates a house of prayer in Augsburg, Germany, said, if you can't love, you can't pray either. Praying is loving, and learning to pray means learning to love. Now, love between people, it comes easy at first and at last. It's effortless in the honeymoon stage when you're smitten and infatuated with one another, touchy and talkative. And it's effortless for the old couple who, who are in union that love for them has become like breathing as they've matured that early infatuation into that effortless union. But all the years in between, uh, love in the midst of building a career and raising kids and establishing a life and falling apart and trying to put the pieces back together, those are the years that love has to be worked at and fought for. Those are the years when that early infatuation is matured into that effortless union. Those are the long years when love is won and lost. And just like love, prayer comes easy at first and at last. It just pours right out of the soul of the sinner who's first encountered grace and of the saint who's walked with Jesus for decades, but all those years in between. The fidelity, those are the years when love is won and lost. Won through prayer and lost through prayerlessness. Teach us to pray. The disciples asked that to Jesus once. But when they asked him that, they were asking a loaded question. Because asking Jesus or, or watching Jesus pray was like watching that final scene from the movie, The Notebook. You know the one I'm talking about? When after all the twists and turns of young, passionate love, Ryan Gosling and Rachel McAdams have wrinkled and plumped into any other elderly old couple. And they're in a hospital room, both nearing the end, and he lies down in her bed, and they fall asleep one last time together dying but still in love, holding on to one another. Now everyone who's ever watched that film gets a little bit misty in that part. And it's because it meets us at that place of our God-given longing. It appeals to our desire in a similar way to Adam's naming the animals exercise did all the way back in Genesis. You see, we all want lasting intimacy and companionship. But there's also a reason that the writer and director of The Notebook had spent the entire film on the early years of infatuated, passionate love and then skipped right to the old couple and effortless union. And that's because all the decades in between the fidelity, it's the boring part. But when you see the fruit of fidelity, there's a longing that's awakened in the human soul that says, that's better than anything I've got. I want that. And when the disciples saw Jesus pray, they said something like, that's better than anything I've got. Show me the kind of prayer that leads to that. And Jesus responds with what we call the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's that one. Now that prayer was scandalous in its intimacy. He was making prayer so intimate that the priests got uncomfortable. But Jesus was also doing something that would have been obvious to those first century Hebrews, but is mostly lost on us 21st century Westerners. And that is that the Lord's Prayer was not entirely original to Jesus. It wasn't something he's just rattling off spontaneously. 
I mean, it certainly seems like Jesus was adapting the opening lines of the Kaddish, which was one of three important recited prayers that was said regularly in the Jewish temple. Here's that prayer. Magnified and hallowed be thy great name in this world in which he created according to his will, and may he establish his kingdom during your life. I mean, look, I'm not trying to accuse you of anything here, Jesus. I'm just saying, that's plagiarism in college. Fascinating, right? That Jesus is taking a common, disciplined Hebrew prayer from the temple and then making it much, 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 much more personal for personal people in search of a personal God. Teach us to pray, and Jesus responds, pray to God more intimately than you think you're allowed to because this whole thing's about love. And center your life according to a disciplined rhythm of prayer because fidelity is where the real treasures are. Jesus was saying something like, here's my secret. Pray with the heart of a lover and the rhythm of a monk. When officiating a wedding, Dietrich Bonhoeffer offered this famous piece of advice to a young couple in love. Today you are young and very much in love, and you think that your love can sustain your marriage. It can't. Let your marriage sustain your love. You see, prayer is about love. And that means that it cannot be sustained on fluttery feelings and good intentions and spontaneous moments and passionate fire alone. It needs a container, something like the fidelity of a marriage, a set of practices within which it can grow and mature to its full potential. And that's not a new idea. Uh, woven throughout various traditions and eras from modern church history all the way back to the church's inception, a set rhythm of prayer has always grounded the life of God's people together. Let your marriage sustain your love. Plant the fire in your heart today in a container where it can be fostered and matured into its full potential in the slog of ordinary days that follows the breakthrough. Prayer is about relationship, and that means that commitment and fidelity is the only container within which it can truly flourish. The, the way uh, to pray like Jesus taught us includes the unavoidable invitation to a daily prayer rhythm. Historically speaking, this is the drum that God's people have always been beating. Pause to pray three times a day, morning, midday, and evening. It's Psalm 55. As for me, I call to God, and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. This is the central plot point of the book of Daniel. Daniel refuses to renounce worship to Yahweh in a Babylonian culture. He won't stop kneeling to pray three times a day in front of a Jerusalem-facing window. He lives by a daily prayer rhythm, and he's going to order his life by that prayer rhythm in a foreign land, not according to the culture, customs, and expectations of the empire. That's the offense that gets Daniel thrown to the lions. In the New Testament, Jesus himself observed a daily prayer rhythm. Every single one of the four Gospels contains descriptions of Jesus withdrawing at set times of prayer according to that same temple rhythm. Now, it is important to note that not every time Jesus prays is according to the fixed rhythm of the temple. So Jesus did pray spontaneously. I mean, it wasn't in the, the daily prayer rhythm of the Jewish people to withdraw for a moonlit all-night prayer hike, for instance. So Jesus did pray spontaneously. But it's equally important to note that Jesus did pray according to a fixed daily rhythm. The overwhelming historic evidence is that Jesus went to the temple three times a day to observe the same morning, midday, and evening rhythm that we see in the book of Daniel and in the Psalms, and many of the biblical references to Jesus in prayer fall into that category. Jesus prayed spontaneously and rhythmically. He prayed alone and with others. He poured out his emotions in his own words, and he prayed according to guided set prayers at fixed hours in the temple. If you keep turning the biblical narrative to the book of Acts, you'll just discover that the earliest Christians continued to anchor their whole communities by the daily prayer rhythm that was taught them by Jesus. Here's a few examples. Acts 3. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Acts 10. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. Acts chapter 4, on their release, meaning their release from trial, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Have you ever wondered how the apostles keep gathering the entire church for an impromptu prayer meeting in a big city in a world before cell phones or email? 
It's because they were already gathering three times a day according to a fixed rhythm. Beyond the book of Acts into early church history, the trend continues. The earliest recovered non-biblical non document documenting church life is called the Didache, which among other things uh, records the morning, midday, and evening prayers observed by all Christians in the global early church. Scott McKnight in his book Praying with the Church delves into this much more deeply if you want to explore the, the history. For our purposes tonight, here's what I'm trying to help you see. A three-part daily prayer rhythm was the anchor to early church church life. And the gift of fidelity was a, an indwelling uh, of intimacy and an outpouring of power. Uh, again, read the book of Acts and highlight every reference to as they were going to the place of prayer and then watch the supernatural kingdom activity that follows that commitment to fidelity. Just to return to the exact places that we just were, in Acts 3, Peter and John exercised the first miraculous healing post-resurrection on their way to midday prayer. Peter received a vision that the gospel was for the nations, not just the nation of Israel, while observing his midday prayers. The foundations of the temple shook in response to the church's ordinary, ordered, daily prayer gathering. So for those keeping score at home, the early church had a higher commitment to fidelity through prayer than the modern church does today, and the early church had a higher ex er, experience of the Spirit's power than the modern church commonly does today. Might there be a commitment between the two? See, a committed daily prayer rhythm and a life of passionate, effective prayer seem to go hand in hand. What I'm getting at is this. My suspicion is that when the Apostle Paul instructed the church, pray without ceasing, he had in mind both a constant state of inward being and an outward, fixed, committed, concrete rhythm. He meant commit yourselves to fidelity. Pray like monks. And as you do, love and power will bloom together within you like a band of wild, radical monks. So I'm advocating that we recover together one of the church's most historic practices that has been forgotten in our time, a daily prayer rhythm, morning, midday, and evening prayer. And that has absolutely nothing to do with legalism and absolutely everything to do with love. Jesus is disciplined was always about freedom and life. When he rolled out of bed before sunrise and made his way to the Mount of Olives to pray, it was love driving him there, not a spiritual scorecard that he was keeping spotless. Uh, a daily prayer rhythm is about planting love in a container where it can grow, mature, and flourish. This is a photo of Philippi Park in Tampa, Florida. It was uh, taken from a local paper in the 1970s. My wife, Kirsten tracked down this photo, had it framed, and then gave it to me for our 10-year anniversary. And of every gift I've ever received, this is undoubtedly my favorite. It hangs right by my bedside. And that's because after I moved to Florida when I was in high school, this is the place that I found myself walking and talking wide-eyed with Jesus. This waterfront park just happened to sit midway on my commute home from school to the house that I lived in. And so regularly, multiple times a week, I would just stop there and I would walk those shaded paths, walking and talking, cultivating deeper intimacy and friendship with Jesus. Now I've got stories of prayer walking with a mission. I know the intercessory prayer of intensity and fire. I know the powerful prayer of more than I can ask or imagine. I know the prophetic kind of prayer that begins with risk and ends with wide-eyed wonder. And I also know the prayer of fidelity and love. And on those afternoons in Philippi Park, I did not want anything from God. I had no plans I was asking him to sponsor. There were no needs I was hoping he would meet. There was no motive, no agenda, no list, only love. I wanted to be with God. So I walked and talked and listened. And now a couple decades removed, I'm suspicious that those afternoons were God's favorites. Because on those ordinary weekday afternoons, it wasn't about changing the world. And it wasn't about trying to get God to act the way I thought God should be acting. And it wasn't even about my own issues or needs. There was no function. It was only love. And mature love definitely involves planning together and intentional conversation and being purposeful. But mature love also involves waste. We waste time with the people that we love. And mature prayer takes Jesus seriously and all of his promises to prayer, and it joins him in the empowerment of his mission, but it also includes waste. Mature prayer wastes time in the company of Jesus. 
for the sake of love. Henry Nouwen says, prayer does not mean much when we undertake it only as an attempt to influence God or as a search for a spiritual fallout shelter or as an offering of comfort in stress-filled times. Prayer is the act by which we divest ourselves of all false belongings and become free to belong to God and God alone. So before prayer is about outcomes or heavenly armies and a righteous uprising, it's about love. It's the way we freely choose the one who freely chose us first. It's the way that we express ourselves to the God who, in spite of everything, still delights in us. It's the way we receive from the God who's got endless stamina to keep coming after ever-wandering people like you and me. Jesus lived by a daily prayer rhythm in a world without iPhones or email, a world even without clocks. What that means is that for Jesus and his earliest followers, prayer marked the passage of time. Everything happened a certain distance from communion with God and a certain distance before communion with God. Prayer or communion with the triune God was the anchor of the everyday. What anchor is your everyday right now? Possibly your workday demands or your email inbox. It might be your next meal or passing hours until the weekend. It could be the crossing off of days until that next event that you're looking forward to, that evening out or that vacation or that whatever. It might just be the buzz of notifications on your phone that you're ever responding to. Something sets the daily rhythm of your life. Something for you marks the passage of time. Uh, And think of the people under your spiritual care. What is at the center of their lives and their days? What do their lives orbit around. Knowing and naming what that is matters because whatever's at the center for you, it, it, it forms you, it shapes you, it, it, it conforms you into its image. You see, there is no neutral in this world. You are being formed right now. There is only intentional spiritual formation and unintentional spiritual formation. The truth is that you and the people under your spiritual care already have a daily prayer rhythm, written or unwritten, chosen by you or chosen for you, conscious or unconscious, based on the kind of person that you want to grow into or based on the over-promising, under-delivering pleasure that you want to feel. Everyone's life is set on an affection, a fidelity that forms them into its image. So what if at the center of your everyday you place communion with the God who personifies love? And what if the waking thoughts of your day were spent dreaming with God, dreams as big as kingdom come and as small as daily bread? And what if you slipped away at midday just for a few minutes or a few seconds because every other force is vying for your attention, but only Jesus has your heart? And what if you spent your commute home or the final moments before you fell asleep at night recounting the magnificent and minuscule ways you saw heaven pierce earth today? What if your day belonged to God, the God whose chief concern is your deepest well-being, who is gently shaping you into the very best version of yourself, and who breathes into your exhaustion with abundant life? What if fidelity to Jesus is everything? And the way that we choose it is as simple as prayer. So I'm not coming to you with some barking call to a more rote, ritualistic prayer life. I'm talking to you about a quiet rebellion about a free choice to order my life by a different order of loves to choose Jesus for the very center. The early Christian church, anchored by prayer, was a phenomenon. A band of oppressed peasants had grown and grown until the Emperor Constantine, the most powerful man on the planet named Christianity, the official religion of the developing world. Out with the gladiatorial Greek gods, we're done pretending that Roman Caesars are divine. This Jesus, who we crucified, is Savior and Lord. It seemed like an astounding victory at first, but it turned out to be a subtle death blow in the end. Because there's this obvious pattern in church history that the people of God always thrive in the worst conditions. But whenever the church buddies up with worldly power, it tends to lead to spiritual powerlessness. So the life of the church that couldn't be stopped was then diluted and watered down. All of the appetites of the surrounding world crept into the lives of believers until they sang different songs, told a different story, had a different Sabbath routine, but their whole lives, their ordinary lives, were no different. And the whole Jesus movement was suddenly free-falling just as fast as it had ascended. Some historians during this time were predicting the extinction of Christianity in their lifetimes. Why? 
because the church was no longer getting into the empire. The empire was getting into the church. Friends, that is our story. But of course, the church didn't hit rock bottom in the fifth century. Life was breathed back into her when everyone wanted to leave her for dead. The community was revived. The potency of the way of Jesus was preserved. And here we are. So what happened to turn the tide? I mean, how did a diluted church recover her prophetic identity? Well, there was this movement of people, mostly unknown to each other at first, who returned to a life that was ordered by wild, radical, ordered fidelity to Jesus. We know them today as the desert fathers and mothers, and they were nothing more than just ordinary people who wanted to continue living the way of life that was common to Jesus and those first apostles, anchoring their whole lives by a living communion with God through prayer. And the result wasn't immediate, it was quite slow, but the result was life so compelling that people began moving out of cities, withdrawing into the desert to live among these people, these radicals. And at a time of chaos and compromise, when the church was losing the world and losing themselves in the process, a few ordinary radicals protected the potency that she had at first, and then renewal flowed back into the city from the desert. The spiritual crisis overtaking the West is the most serious since the fall of the Roman Empire in the fifth century. The light of Christianity is flickering out all over the Western Hemisphere. There are people alive today who may live to see the death of Christianity. That was the Pope less than 10 years ago. So what's the antidote to a church that's no longer getting into the empire, but an empire that's getting into the church? It's a few radicals who say together, let's order our lives according to a different love and let's anchor everything according to fidelity and prayer. Let's bank everything on fidelity to Jesus and discover through prayer if he really is who he says he is. If he really does satisfy the soul's desires like nothing else can. If he still writes the best stories and wildest adventures through fidelity. If his power really is made perfect in weakness and if Ordinary love on the ordinary days is where the real treasures are found. The church was renewed in the fifth century not because of some novel method or new innovation or sociocultural strategy or wildly gifted preacher, but because a few ordinary radicals had the audacity to live an ancient way in a new time. And the church in this nation is in desperate need of renewal. And we don't have what it takes which is the perfect starting place. Yes. The church can be renewed, yes. but it won't be because of a novel method or a new innovation or a sociocultural strategy or a wildly gifted preacher. It will only be if a few ordinary radicals have the audacity to live the ancient way in a new time and place. Yes. Yes. So how on earth do we live this? And how do we keep on living it after the inspiration wears off on all the ordinary days after the breakthrough? Well, the, the invitation that we as 24-7 USA want to offer to churches and communities and individuals, anyone who wants to run alongside us is this, unceasing prayer through two rhythms, through a daily prayer rhythm and through a prayer room. Two rhythms practiced in community, one aimed at love expressed through fidelity and the other aimed at love expressed through spontaneity because this is an invitation to love. And every substantive relationship is built on equal parts rhythm and spontaneity. Most prayer though is spontaneity with no rhythm or rhythm with no spontaneity, which is a tragedy only because it limits love. It's two rhythms practiced together in one broader family. Now let me break this down practically. The first of those rhythms is a daily prayer rhythm. The early church for its first three centuries, as best we can tell, prayed some version of in the morning, pray the Lord's Prayer, at midday, pray the Shema, and in the evening, pray the Psalms. Now again, that's as best as we can tell. The history's not an exact science here, but we are certain that it's some version of what I've just laid out there. So we've designed a modern rhythm according to that ancient one. In the morning, pray the Lord's Prayer. At midday, pray for the lost. And in the evening, pray gratitude. That's an attempt to thematically capture the early church prayer rhythm for a new people in a new time and a new place. In the morning, pray the Lord's Prayer. Start your day with God. 
And that's a, a simple practice that is not about discipline or personality type, it's about love. I am yet to discover a single man or woman of faith who made a significant mark for the kingdom of God and whose life we are looking to emulate and be shaped by who didn't spend the opening movements of their day in communion with God through prayer. And when I say pray the Lord's Prayer, I'm not saying recite this thing from memory like a script. I'm saying let the movements of the Lord's Prayer guide you into movements of your own prayer. Let it be springboards that send you into your own movements of prayer with God. And then at midday, pray for the lost. I'd love you just to imagine this with me. If you just indulge me for a second. It's you, mid-work day. Whatever that means for you, if it means sitting at a desk or running an open house or caring for patients or raising children, can you just see yourself there at the midpoint of your day? Now you escape the workflow for just a minute or two. It could be a, into a moment of contemplative silence seated at your desk or for a walk around the block outside your office building or just pulling, a, a, like John and Charles Wesley's mother did, pulling the apron over your head for a second as a signal that the kids need to leave you alone for 10 seconds. You're escaping because you know a secret. You know the secret that this kingdom that everyone is so feverishly building willing their bodies and their brains into just a couple more hours of productive focus. This is not the kingdom that will last. It's not the one that's gonna stand forever. You steal away because you know that secret. But you also steal away because you have to. You have to or you'll forget that secret. You'll start to believe the same subtle lie that this small temporary kingdom is the ultimate one. That some small voice is the one that defines your ultimate worth. You steal away to recover your true identity and the true story that you inhabit. I wonder how you would live differently if right at the midpoint of your every day you stopped just for 60 seconds to say, Jesus. Jesus, you're the good shepherd who goes to seek and to save the lost. And so Jesus, would you go seeking Joni and Steve and Colette and Sanvi and Jamal. And Jesus, would you reform my heart so that it is broken for what has broken yours? And would you send me out in compassion? Make me the response to my own prayers. I mean, how might that alter your afternoon? Or how might that, practiced over the course of weeks and months, begin to shift your heart and your attention? How might that ultimately change the people that occupy your ordinary days. And then in the evening, pray gratitude. You know, we tend to litter our dinner tables with the leftovers of the day. We tend to carry the events of our days home with us, not because we want to, we just do. So what if instead of spending your commute home stewing over that one unpleasant interaction or planning on how you're gonna handle that situation or reordering your agenda tomorrow to get to all the things you didn't quite get to today, you simply gripped a subway pole or held onto a steering wheel and you recounted all the magnificent and minuscule ways that you saw heaven pierce earth today. Morris West says that there's a certain point in the spiritual journey when our prayer vocabulary gets summarized just to these three phrases, thank you, thank you. Thank you. So what if you began to litter your dinner table with the fruit of the Spirit instead of with the day's leftovers? Look, I'm not trying to invite you into some new innovative idea here. I'm just trying to invite you to pray as Jesus prayed and to pray as those who got close to him kept on praying and to pray the way the church prayed at first and to pray the way the church has tragically forgotten. So beginning today and then going forward as core to the life of 24-7 USA is a vision for fidelity, for ordering your life individually and ordering the life of the community that you represent corporately according to a fixed daily prayer rhythm. So here's the invitation. It's unceasing prayer practiced through two rhythms, through a daily prayer rhythm, and then secondly, through a prayer room. So annually, we are calling you and your community into a wild and radical priority of organizing a prayer room. That is the bread and butter of 24-7, and prayer rooms are a simple way that we embody the central priority of prayer, put it right at the heart of who we are as communities, and then it creates these moments and stories that deepen the rhythm that we live by the rest of the year. So many of you have run prayer rooms before and you've watched as your communities came alive in a way that they never did through the very best sermon you've ever preached. <laughs> Just through one face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus by closing a door 
and blocking out everything else. But in the 20 year history of 24 seven prayer in this nation, we've never organized set times for, for running a prayer room at the same time for all of our communities in any given year. And so the question I've been asking is, what might God do among your people if they shared a month of night and day prayer with a house church in Baltimore and a mega church in Dallas and a halfway house in St. Louis and a public prayer space in Charlotte and a global nonprofit in LA? I mean, what kind of stories could we tell across all of those communities? And what if your church in Queens or Tulsa or Chicago was propelled uh, by the current of a prayer room and a story that came out of an overwhelmed mother of five in Nashville or a burned out but restored leader in Miami or a recovering addict in San Francisco? Uh, what if we prayed like the early church and we rediscovered the power of the unified church? So here's the plan. For the 40 days of Lent, culminating in a massive party on Easter Sunday, we want to live this together. We want to run prayer rooms in every community that's represented in this room, and we want to tell the stories and share the stories across all those different places together. But I want to do more than just empower you to do this. I want to make sure that you're equipped to do this. So for the daily prayer rhythm, we've partnered with 24-7 International to create the Inner Room app which includes guides to lead you through these three rhythms I just described in both written and audio format. So you can be led into the movements of the Lord's Prayer every morning by reading them off and then letting that guide you into prayer to God on your phone. Or you can just pop in some earbuds and hear some Sigurosi synthy music as a, as a stunningly gorgeous accent does that for you, whichever you prefer. You can set reminders that prompt you to pray these prayers at set times in the day that you choose what morning and midday and evening looks like for you. And there's even reach practice that would help you go deeper into each one of these rhythms. So I've had the honor of writing the content for this. The team behind Lectio 365 did all the real hard work and developed the app. And that is available wherever you get your apps right now. Our vision is prayer. This app is just a tool. But my encouragement would be just download it on your device and use that app both personally and across your local church family because for any new practice, it's always good to go with a guide first. And when you have thoroughly explored the land and know it like the back of your hand, then sure, find your own pathways and go your own way. But go with the guide until you know the land like that. And then secondly, when it comes to prayer rooms, on our website, you'll find all the technology and resources that are needed to plan, organize, resource, and implement a prayer room. So here's the invitation. Unceasing prayer through two rhythms, through a daily prayer rhythm aimed at fidelity, and through a prayer room aimed at spontaneity and breakthrough, because this thing's about love. So that's the invitation. Are you in? I think 20% of the room's giving me a maybe. <laughs> I can live with that tonight. So I wanna close with this. The Moravian revival started in the 1700s when a radical German guy named Zinzendorf turned his inherited family property into a refugee relief site with 34 homes. They named that place Herrenhunt, which meant the Lord's Watch, and together they dreamed of recapturing the radical life of the early church. About five years into that dream, they were mostly disappointed, disillusioned, and thinking of packing it away altogether because the vision sounded really eloquent when it was put down on paper, but it looked really messy when it was embodied relationally between the actual people. Confronted by their own weakness, they then began to pray like monks. 48 refugees committed to an ordered rhythm of daily prayer. Just five years into that commitment, a refugee village of 32 homes had accidentally launched the greatest missions movement in world history. The prayer meeting that started there with those refugees then went on for 100 years, a century of nonstop 24-7 prayer. They weren't fanatics. They were radicals, which comes from the Latin radix, meaning root. It's a word picture. Radicals are those whose fruitfulness is wild and free and abundant because they have deep roots. You see, the Moravians, like so many before them, chose fidelity to Jesus, and he saves the best adventures for those who freely choose his love. Now, what was their secret? Plenty of people ask that. Plenty of people tell the Moravian story because they want to bottle up the magic and take it into their time and place and live the same adventure. So what was their secret? Well, here it is from Zinzendorf himself. He said the recipe is this. I have one passion. It is he. Only he. 
This is about love for me. This is not about a savior with a, with a five-part plan and a five-year strategy. This is about a savior who defends people when they're covered in shame, who stands them up on their feet, looks them in the eye and says, then neither do I condemn you. And when that's your story, all that matters is remaining in that love. So this is not a fast track to revival. It's not a hocus pocus solution for drumming up something powerful. This is a pathway to love expressed through prayer to keep on choosing him on all the ordinary days. This is about rebellious fidelity because that is where the real treasures are. Let's stand. Did you come, Holy Spirit? Come, Spirit. Just a couple of days ago, as I was imagining this invitation to this room, I was reminded of this scene from The Hobbit when Bilbo opens the door for Gandalf, that wise old wizard, and he lets him into his home, and 12 dwarfs then scatter in behind him, and they all start raiding Bilbo's pantry like you wouldn't believe. And so he's like scrambling around, making sure everyone has what they need, getting dishes, and, and, and making sure everyone's well fed, and then his pantry's entirely bare, and he's completely exhausted, and he just sits down trying to catch his breath, and when he does, these dwarfs all begin to sing like a choir. And Bilbo just sits there and he's being washed in this ancient but forgotten song, familiar to some deepest part of him and some deepest memory and it begins to pull a deep, calls out to deep, best part of him up to the surface. And as he's washed in that ancient tune, we read this, something tookish woke up inside of him. And he wished to go and see the great mountains and hear the pine trees and waterfalls and explore the caves and wear a sword instead of a walking stick. And I just wonder if something like that might be happening to some of you tonight. There's a moment in the book of Genesis when Isaac redigs the wells the Philistines filled. I'm not talking to you about a new well. I don't have any new ideas. The way of church in the future is not new, it is ancient. What I'm talking about is an old well caked over with debris and dirt, and I'm just trying to say, hey, I found this ancient well, and I cleared some debris off the top, and you wouldn't believe this, but there's living water in here. Would you come and drink? So will you come, Holy Spirit? Just invite you into whatever posture of prayer is on us for you. Would you come, Holy Spirit?